Thanks for listening to the Sunday morning sermon from Grace Community Church in Maybank, Texas. For more information, please visit www.gccmaybank.org. all the snotting and hacking and hollering, so shameless plug, Young Living makes this uh, little oil called purification. You just dab it right here and put it on the bottom of your feet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, mix. <laughs> Aren't you thankful that Jesus has saved you? Amen. Aren't you thankful that He has forgiven you? Amen. That your sin, your debt has been uh, taken away from you and you now have the ability because of Christ to live, uh, live a new way. That, that you are no longer bound by your, your past. The issue is, uh, maybe something that you have faced before, I know that I've struggled with this, is that Although I know that Jesus has saved me from sin, although I know that I am forgiven of my sin, the, the issue is, is that I still sin. I may be come to shock to you, but ask my wife, she says, yeah, that dude's a real sinner. Okay. Yeah, the reality is, is that as a Christian, you still sin. You struggle with sin. And there's, there's a lot of ways to think through this. One way is to say, well, I'm a Christian, I'm forgiven, so I'm just going to keep sinning. Well, that's obviously unbiblical, right? right? The other option is to say, well, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian, I sin, I don't know what to do, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to, you know, make rules and laws in my own life and put parameters around myself so I don't, so I don't sin. That's what's called legalism. But the, the, the question that we have to ask is, is what, what does the Bible say? What does Scripture say about your individual fight with sin? How can you, as a believer in Jesus Christ, war, make war against your sin and overcome that sin? And that's the thing that we all want to aspire to, right? We really want to overcome those particular things that hinder us. The text that we're going to look at this morning, Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 11, provides us the answer to the question, how can I overcome sin in my life? How can I walk, as the Bible says, walk in victory over the particular besetting sins in my life? Life. What we're going to see here in verses 5 through 11 are really two key truths. And these two key truths are found here in verse 5 and in verse 8. And what, what I want to, what my objective is, what I want to labor to do this morning is, is to try to apply those truths in a very specific ways to help you walk through uh, whatever may be. Uh, whatever you may be struggling with this morning. So if you would, go ahead and stand with me as we read uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 11. The Bible reads in verse 5, Therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, or your earthly members, and he specifies what this is. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. Verse 9. But now, there's a change, put away all the following. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your now, the do not lie to one another, and he provides the reason here, since you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self. You're being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your Creator. In Christ, there is no Greek or Jew, <coughs> circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian or Scythian, 
slave and free. But Christ is all and in all. Lord Jesus, we approach you now. And we pray, Lord, that you would cleanse us once again of sin. That you would allow whatever is on the outside uh, to remain out there. Allow us to focus now on this passage. Lord, we want to walk in the forgiveness that you've granted us. We want to walk in freedom. We want to fight and war against the sin that seeks to destroy us. And I pray, Lord, now that you would illuminate our hearts, our minds, our eyes, spiritual eyes, that we may see the truth of this passage. And that we would walk in it. We would love it. That we would rest in what you have for us now. Lord, we love you. We thank you that you first loved us. Pray, God, that you would crucify me so that Christ may live. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that I may preach to the glory of God our Father. We ask this now in the King's name and His people said. Amen. Amen. Colossians chapter 3. Uh, we talked about last week, verses 1 through 4. What we have here is this transitional section in the book. In chapter 1, I'm not going to rehearse all of it. I want to give you a, just a quick overview. Colossians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul defines what the gospel is, that Jesus is the exalted Lord on the basis of his death and resurrection, that by his death we now have entrance into the kingdom, we've been transferred from one domain, the domain of darkness, into the kingdom of his Son. We are no longer under the reign of sin and Satan, and as a result, Christ is now our Lord. So chapter 1 defines for us this beauty in this, uh, this overwhelming truth of the gospel. But in chapter 2, Paul uh, wants to lay out this warning. And the warning is that there are, uh, there are false gospels out there. There's a uh, self-righteous religion, a self-made religion that seeks to say, you can believe in Jesus, but if you really want to be saved, you've got to do X, Y, and Z. It's Jesus plus something. <coughs> And so Paul says, run away from those things. Don't let those things take you captive. Don't let anyone judge you regarding how they worship or how you worship. Trust in Christ. And now in chapter 3, Paul is saying, here's how you apply the gospel in your life. Here's how you take the knowledge of the gospel... Uh, this truth that Jesus died, was raised from the dead, exalted in heaven. And here's how it becomes a real, tangible reality in your life. The gospel is not just something that you believe. It is something that you experience by the power of Christ. Amen. So verses 1 through 4, Paul says that you can pursue and you can be preoccupied with the things of heaven. That it should be your aim that you chase after the things of heaven because you are now positioned in Christ. You have been raised with Him. You have died with Him. You are hidden with Him. Your life is so attached to Jesus that Paul says, Christ is your life. And then he says here in verses 5 through 11, Therefore, on the basis of that truth, Paul is drawing an inference here. On the basis of the truth that you and I as believers are now positioned and participating with the resurrected Lord of the entire universe, that we can pursue and be preoccupied with the things of heaven. Therefore, he says, you got to do something now. you got to deal with the issues that are pent up within you. See, it's fine and dandy. It preaches a really good sermon when we say, pursue and be preoccupied with heaven. That sounds good. But then Paul says, hey, therefore, you've got to do something about your sin. You see, the fact, the truth is, the evidence that you are pursuing heaven, the evidence that you are preoccupied with the things of heaven, are demonstrated now in terms of how you kill your sin. Yes, brother and sister, you may be forgiven and you may be destined golden ticket to heaven, but you still have to deal with the pent up sin that is within your heart. Amen. How do you do that? Well, I want you to see this first truth here. Therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature. Now, this may, 
may make some Baptists kind of uncomfortable here. Put to death. Kill. Okay? Uh, the King James, I believe, translates it, mortify your sin. Right? What an intense word. Mortify it. Put to death. Crucify what belongs to your earthly nature, my translation says. The idea is that there is something in you that is fleshly, that is, uh, Paul says, what is earthly. You could say what is sinful. You see, as a believer in Jesus Christ, the gospel truth is, if you have trusted in the Lord, you have been freed from the penalty of sin, because Jesus took that on your behalf, and you've been freed from the power of sin, because the Spirit has liberated you. But the issue is, is you still have sin with inside of you. You have the presence of sin with inside of you. And Paul knows this, and he says, kill it. Put it to death. Uh, the, one of the great Puritans, John Owens, wrote a book called The Mortification of Sin. Right? I bet you, you wouldn't see that in many Christian bookstores. Right? The Mortification of Sin. He writes in there, be killing sin, or it will be killing you. You have an enemy. And it's not Satan. Yeah, he may mess around sometimes. But your greatest enemy is the sin within you. Left to your own devices, you would destroy yourself. And so you and I must be, dare I say, militant against the sin within us. We must have this intentional act of realizing our sin rejecting its power and refusing to participate in it. We must kill it. Put to death your sin. But then Paul, he, he knows the objection. He knows what people are going to say in the congregation. Well, Paul, what do you really mean by sin? What, what do you mean by death? Notice what he says here. He says, Therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature. And he lists five things. First of all, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, greed, which is idolatry. I want you to see these five things for a moment. Sexual immorality, that's the echoing back all the way to Leviticus chapter 18. It's what's called the holiness code. And there, uh, the author of uh, Leviticus, God himself, is saying that there are particular sexual acts that are not biblical. They're not godly. And what are some of those things? Uh, this word uh, in Greek, the sexual immorality, is the Greek word porneia. Does that sound like an English word, pornography? Well, the Greek word here, porneia, can describe any sexual act outside of the biblical parameters of marriage, which is one man and one woman for life. So what does sexual immorality mean? Let me just run through the list real quick so we're all on the same page. Biblically, it is fornication. It is a sexual act outside of the, outside of the parameters of one man, one woman for life. Adultery. Cheating on your spouse. It's unbiblical. Bestiality. Now, I hope you don't struggle with this. Okay, Incest. Homosexuality. Those things fall under the category of sexual immorality. How? It's because it is going all the way back to an Old Testament truth. The holiness code in Leviticus chapter 18. Paul is saying here, catch this. He is saying that if, the, if this is within you, if you are acting out on this sexual immorality as a Christian, you have the responsibility to what? Refuse to participate in it and destroy it before it kills you. So he says here, sexual immorality, impurity. Impurity has this idea of moral uncleanness, immoral behavior that arises out of our fallen desires. And then he says, lust. Well, what is lust? It's uh, shameful sexual passions that lead to sexual excess. Evil desires. Internal sinful impulses that seek to control a person. 
And then he says greed, and automatically our minds go all the way to, well, greed for money. Well, the issue is, is that oftentimes in the New Testament, and even the Old Testament, this idea of greed is intrinsically connected with a greed for sex. A desire to release the passion, which he says is idolatry. And you may be saying, well, I don't struggle with any of these things. Well, here's the reality. You do struggle with something. You will struggle with something in your life. Let me just speak very clearly. Brothers and sisters, you are not as good as you think you are. I'm not as good as I think I am. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, Take heed lest you fall. This warning, this command here, is not given to unbelievers. It's given to Christians. Put those things to death. Kill them. Mortify them. Amen. When I was in Oxford several years ago, uh, we did a few things. We hit all the coffee shops there. We went to uh, the Eagle and Child, the Bird and the Baby. The, um, it was a pub. I didn't drink, by the way. But it was a pub that C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and Charles Williams went to. And that's where Lewis actually wrote a lot of the Chronicles of Narnia. So... Check one for me. Uh, but one thing in Oxford that you have to do, it's man, mandatory, is you have to visit all the bookstores. You see, in, in Oxford, they don't deal drugs, they deal books. Okay, So we hit all the bookstores, new bookstores, old bookstores, big bookstores, little bookstores. Went to this one bookstore, it was really shady. Okay, you Had to walk down a back, back alley, and uh, no joke, had to walk down this back alley, and there's a little side door there. And you had to knock on it. So the little curator, no joke, this curator would come up. You know, he's like 85 years old. And he opens the door. You can just imagine, like, this guy's seen a lot in Oxford. The big bug glasses. And, I mean, this dude was awesome. But he opened the door. And you had to pass through this long hallway. And about halfway through this long hallway, you begin to smell the fragrance of books. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. And I was walking around and I was looking at all these books. And we're, we're talking about a little bitty, little tiny space. But it was one of the best resources, old resources in Oxford because they had original first editions of a lot of books. There was one book that I pulled off. I began to look at it. I recognized the cover and you'll know it. It's Alice in Wonderland. Right, Lewis Carroll. Thing was, is it was the first edition, oh, Alice wow. in Wonderland. I didn't have enough money to purchase this book. I could have purchased the book, but I wouldn't have been able to eat for the next five days that I was in Oxford. So I, uh, I had this book, this first edition of Alice in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll in my hands. Now you know one character in there, obviously Alice, but you also know another one, the Queen of Hearts, don't you? What is the Queen of Hearts known for? Really one single sentence that she repeats over and over and over again. <laughs> Off with her head! Right? right? That's what she's known for. Yeah. Over and over and over again. And brothers and sisters, we have to capture the same idea. Off with sin's head. What must we be known for? Yes, loving Jesus. But a radical pursuit to kill the sin within us before it kills us. Well, why is this? Notice here in verse 6, he provides the reason. Why should we put to death the sin that is within us? It is because God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. Like it or not, God's wrath is coming. You can go other places to hear all different types of sermons, but the fact of the matter is, one of the main catalysts one of the main motivations for us to kill the sin within us is because God's judgment is coming. Right. And at that time, He will not play games. Yeah. He is coming with a burning vengeance of wrath against sin. Yep. You think about Romans chapter 1, for example. Romans chapter 1, this downward spiral of depravity. You think about Galatians chapter 5. The works of the flesh are evident that if you practice these things, 
you will not inherit the kingdom of God. I think one of the main issues within a lot of Baptist churches in America is we don't take sin seriously. We don't. <coughs> yes, we should love the grace of God. Yes, we should love the love of God. We should love the mercy of God. But we should be terrified of the consequences of sin. Why? Because God's wrath is coming. He is holy. You are not. Therefore, repent. And notice what he says here. He provides the second reason. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. Paul says, destroy the sin within you. Because God's wrath is coming against it. Oh, and by the way, this is not your lifestyle anymore. You once walked in these things. So Paul is saying, destroy it. Kill it. <coughs> okay, well the question is, is how do you put to death these things? How do you put these things to death? Let me provide you three considerations. Three considerations for application here. What does it mean to put to death the sin that is within you? I think the first one is we must understand the pattern of our problem. We have to understand the pattern of our problem. I want you to see this here. Check this out. When he says sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, greed, which is idolatry, he is moving from the external to the internal. See, sexual immorality, before it ever expresses itself in a physical act, it is always embedded within your heart. That's what Jesus said. I say unto you, if you look upon a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. Here's the thing. It comes down to this. The sin, the outward sins that we see, and the outward manifestations of the sin in your own life, are actually internal impulses that are embedded within your still fallen heart. It comes down to this. You have made an idol of your sin. That's why Paul says, greed which is idolatry. A lust, a desire for something that is not yours. It's idolatry. We must understand the pattern of our problem that the impulses of the heart are manifested through the sinful acts of your body. While you only see the external, Paul is saying, kill the internal impulses. Put those things to death. Well, I can't. I just have these thoughts. I have these desires all the time. That's why you and I must be militant against our sin. That's why Paul says, take every thought captive. That's why he says, bad company corrupts good morals. That if you're around a whole bunch of people who are doing the same sinful things, and you're like, well, I'm a Christian, therefore you can't touch me. Brother, sister, be wise. Be wise. Well, Jesus hung around with all the sinners. He was Jesus. He was Jesus. He didn't sin. You do. You got problems. He didn't. Be wise. If you are struggling with a particular thing, whatever that particular thing is, you must, you must understand that before it's ever acted out upon, it's already within you. To put it to death. You must flee from the punishment of your practice. You must understand that a continual habitual act of sin will lead to death. We're not talking about perfection here. We're talking about biblical Christianity. I find it interesting that whenever Jesus healed someone. He healed someone, right? What did he say at the very end of it all? Go and sin no more. 
Why would he say that? It's because their life had been transformed. If you have met Jesus, you have entered into a new life. So understand the pattern of your problem. Flee from the punishment of your practice. What does it mean to flee? Run away from it! <laughs> Destruction is coming! Run from the thing that will kill you! I told you the story about the cougar that chased me, right? The panther. <coughs> I was up in a tree. The panther screamed. The cougar yelled. What did I do? Huh. I think I should run. <laughs> you heard this thing. Ah! Just scream at the top of your lung, at the top of its lungs. <laughs> it wasn't a good idea for me to be sitting in the tree in the first place while hunting for coyotes. But when it screamed the second time, it was a warning shot. Stupid. Get out of the tree. <laughs> Can you hear me? <laughs> so what did I do? I did like any country boy would do. I fired two rounds out of a 12 gauge shotgun and I jumped 12 feet out of a tree and I ran for my life! <laughs> you must do the same thing with your sin. You must realize that your sin will kill you. It has one objective, to destroy you. So you must seek and destroy your sin before it seeks and destroys you. And you must realize, here's the third consideration, you must realize the predicament of your past. You must understand the pattern of your problem, that it begins internally before it's ever expressed out physically and the, uh, externally. You must flee from the punishment of your practice, run away from your sin, and you must realize the predicament of your past. You were once disobedient. If you are a Christian this morning, you have been liberated. Amen. You've been freed from sin. Don't go back to it. What was the issue with Israel? Israel had seen the, the mighty saving acts of God. They walked through on dry land. The waters, poof, you know, they were, you could see fish in the waters, right? I mean, the waters parted. They walked through on dry land. But what did they do on the other side? Hey, let's go back to Egypt. Okay. Let's, let's just go back. We're comfortable there. The temptation for you <coughs> as a believer is return back to your Egypt. Don't. Believe, realize that you have been free from your predicament. He saved you. But I want you to see here, notice what the text says. Verse 5 says, put to death, but now, but now verse 8. But now, put away. He changes the image. The first image was a very destructive image. Kill it. Mortify it. Crucify it. Don't let it live. And now he says, put it away. <coughs> you, could, you could translate this, uh, lay it aside. Uh, take it off. The idea is to renounce its power. That's the idea. Uh, when, when I played soccer... Um, <clears throat> played soccer from the age of 4 to the age of 17. About the, about the age of, of, of 12, started having issues with my ankles. Um, sprained ankles, torn ligaments, I mean, things like that, just really bad stuff. Um, I had to tape my ankles all the time. Anytime I played soccer, any kind of sports, I'd have to tape my ankles because I could be walking and hit it like a rock and you know, fall over. It was really bad. So especially when I was running in little bitty cleats, I had to tape my ankles. But I had these special shin guards. These shin guards that actually not only covered the shin, but they actually covered the ankles themselves. I mean, it was like triple stacked, you know, my ankles are not bending. You know, I had to walk around kind of like this. I mean, whoa, it's kind of awkward. But nevertheless, 
<laughs> hey, watch out for that. It'll get you every time. Uh, but but the, the, the idea is, is that my ankles couldn't move. But here's the thing. I did something to protect me, but in the end, at the end of the soccer game, what was the first thing that I took off after the soccer game? The shin guards. I cut the tape off. I laid it aside. It actually became more of a hindrance than it was a help. You see, we think that our sin in some way, well, if I'm just tough enough, if I'm just bold enough, you know, I, I, I like it when people stand up for the truth and they don't like anybody to tell them what to do. Well, maybe that guy's just arrogant. If, if, if I can just prove myself, we think that our sin can actually help us a lot of times. Man, if I was just, if I was just a little bit more, you know, quick, the way that I think, I wouldn't get into trouble. Maybe if my, if my lies were a little bit more smooth, rounded off, not sharp around the edges. Maybe. You know, we think that our sin can help us, but in the end, what, what happens? It's a hindrance. It will destroy you. So Paul is saying here, not only put to death those things that seek to kill you, he says, lay down those things. Take those things off. And what are those things? Notice what he says here. Put away. Take off all the following. Okay, so we talked about sexual immorality, impurity, evil desires, all those gross things. But now he says this. Anger. Wrath. Malice. Slander. Filthy language. Lying. Okay, let's be real. In a Baptist church, we have no issues talking about how bad homosexuals are. But here's the thing. When we start talking about anger and wrath and malice and slander, that's when Baptists start getting their toes hurt. Because here's the thing. You can see divisible acts of sexual immorality. And we living in the Bible Belt in a very conservative culture, well, are all prim and proper. Call it like I see it. Those things are wrong. Yeah, what about what about anger? You know what anger is? It's the inability for you to control your emotion. Well, I like that guy. He tells it like it is. No, he has an anger issue. He has an anger problem. He's not man enough to control his emotion. That's what he is. Anger. It's a violent emotion. Literally, the word in the original language has to do with, in some context, uh, with a fruit that continues to swell till it bursts. That's mm -hmm. what anger is. Mm -hmm. It's a violent emotion within you, the inability to control the emotion to the point that what happens? Wrath. You know what wrath is? Wrath is the unbridled, unbridled outburst of anger. Well, I like his passion. You know, that dude just has, has anger issues. <clears throat> he just has anger issues. Can't control himself. Outburst of wrath. It's an angry temper. It's an outward manifestation of anger. What about malice? It's one of those old archaic words. Malice is the inward viciousness of disposition. Have you ever heard the word of being malicious? It means you're vicious. That you have an alternative, uh, have an alternative plan. You want to be malicious, malicious intent. So you have anger, you have wrath, you have malice, you have slander. It's abusive language aimed at an individual with the intention to harm them. What about filthy language? It's disgraceful speaking directed at a person. Lying. Do not lie to one another. It's the intentional misrepresentation of truth for your own gain. You see what the issue is? All these things that Paul names, if you boil it down, it comes down to this. Your own self-centeredness. That's what it comes down to. The reason, hear me, 
The reason why people commit sexual immorality, adultery, is not because of the other person, it's because of their own sinful heart. The reason why people slander other people is because the individual who commits the act of slandering is selfish. They want to defend themselves. The reason why people get angry is not because the other person is doing this, that, or the other. It's because the other person isn't conforming to the norms of the angry person. And this other person is walking around on eggshells when this person... You don't know if he's gonna if he's gonna blow up or not. She's gonna blow up. It's all about the individual person. You see what sin does? Sin consumes you to the point that you make yourself an idol. You can't touch me. You can't say these things to me. You can't do this. Sin distorts our way of thinking. Convinces us that we are invincible. Until it kills us. So Paul is saying here, put away your sin. Why? We're going to end on this. Why? It is because you have put off the old self. And you've put on the new self. And this new self is being renewed in the knowledge according to the image of, his, of your Creator. Here's the truth, brother and sister. As a believer in Jesus, you can put to death that sinful presence within you. You can do that. You have the power to do it, not because it resides within yourself, but because Jesus. The power of the Spirit's within you. And you have the ability... To lay aside those sinful activities of wrath and anger. Not because it comes natural to you. But because something radical has transformed you. <clears throat> Notice what the text says. Since you have put off the old self. Paul would say it in Romans. You've put, to, you've put off the body of sin. Do you realize that as a believer, your sin nature had actually died? When you trusted in Christ, your sin nature died. That's what Paul says. It was crucified. Well, why do I still sin? Well, it's because you got sin within you. You've been freed from the power of sin. You've been freed from the penalty of sin. But you still got the presence of sin within you. But here's the good news. You are no longer bound. Listen. As a believer, you are no longer bound to the old person anymore. You're no longer bound by your sinful nature. That died when you trusted in Christ. And when you trusted in Christ, something radical happened to you. You put on the new self. You've put on the new self. You know what that means? You're brand spanking new in Christ. You're no longer the same old person doing the same old things with Jesus tagged on. You have been radically altered by the cosmic Lord of the universe. <coughs> you have put on the new self. So within you, you have new desires. Within you, you have a new start. Within you, you have the ability to walk in freedom. Just quickly, let me provide you four ways to think about this. Quickly. Never believe a Baptist preacher when they say quickly. <laughs> what does it mean to put on the new self? It means you repent of the presence of sin in your person. What does it mean to put on the new self? It means now you have the ability to repent. That's really good news. Amen. Apart from the grace of God, you would never repent. 
Apart from the saving mercy of God, you would never repent. Now, as Christians, we have the ability to objectively look at ourselves and say, my life does not line up to this. Therefore, I need the grace of Jesus to repent. So we repent of the presence of sin in our person. It is because sin runs contrary to our new self who's in Christ. Here's the second thing. We live according to the privilege of our position. We live according to the privilege of our position in Christ. As a believer, please hear me. You have died to your old self. That old self was buried in baptism. Remember we talked about this thing? This little thing that looks like a jacuzzi, right? It's not a jacuzzi. It's not a hot tub either. But when you, when you were buried, when you died, what you were communicating to everybody is that the old person has been laid in the grave. And, and by, by His grace, you've been raised from the dead, spiritually. But not only that, you have now been seated with Christ in the heavenly realm. Walk in that. Walk in that freedom. Realizing that you are not just some wretched old sinner. You have now entered into sainthood. Because of Jesus. Live within that. Renew the possibility of your progress. And so when you sin... When you feel the welling up of sin within you and you have that desire to, to sin, you walk through the process of repenting and living according to your privilege, you renew the possibility by saying, hey, I'm not perfect just yet. It's a renewal process. I want you to see here, you're being renewed. That's a passive language. Passive language, it means that God is the one renewing you. So you repent of your sin, you live according to your new nature, you renew the possibility, but catch this, you believe in the prize of your perseverance. Notice here, in Christ there is no Greek or Jew, uncircumcised, circumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but check this out, but Christ is all and in all. Christ, I'm going to paraphrase it this way for these Texans. Christ is all you need. And if you are in Christ, He is in you. How do you put to death your sin? And how do you put away your sin? You must enact war against your sin. You must become militant by the power of the Holy Spirit that has taken up residency within you to kill that which will kill you. You become radical in your pursuit of Jesus and let Jesus equip you to fight your sin. Because apart from Jesus, apart from Christ, you would never want to get rid of your sin. Because by nature we love our sin too much. But in Christ, because of Him, you've been free. You've died. You've been raised. You are now seated with Christ. So it goes back to verses 1 through 4. Pursue and be preoccupied with Jesus. And let Him kill your sin. But this morning, you must open yourself up to that. You must be willing to say, I am sick and tired of getting my face smashed in by sin. I'm sick and tired of walking my old way. 
I'm done with it. I throw in the white towel. And I'm ready to declare war against that which seeks to destroy me. And you must ask Jesus, Lord, equip me with the strength and the power to mortify my sin. You want to live for Jesus. You want to follow Him. Here's the invitation. Repent. Repent. Maybe this morning you're sitting here and, and you have something that is just hindering you. You know what it is. It's been dwelling in your heart for a long time. And you've been convicted. The Spirit has worked within you this morning. You've been convicted. And you simply need to let it go. This morning is your opportunity to let it go. You can come to the front. You can kneel down. You can pray. You can grab me and pray. You can pray wherever you're at. Let it go. Repent. Live within Christ. Realize His power. Maybe this morning you're not a believer and you have been living your life consuming sin. And you've been drinking it, and you've been loving it, but you realize that it will one day kill you. Here's the good news. If you trust in Jesus, you can be free from that. You can be liberated. And even though you will die physically, you'll be raised from the dead. You can inherit eternal life. The forgiveness of sin. You can be free from your besetting sin if you trust in Jesus. My exhortation to you, brother and sister, is kill sin before it kills you. Run to Jesus before sin consumes you. So God, we come to you now. Lord, it's a heavy word because it addresses real things in our lives. It's a heavy word because it challenges us to examine ourselves, to make sure that we are not just living appropriately, but we're believing appropriately. Oh God, I pray now for my friends, my brothers and sisters. God, empower them by your Spirit that they may be able to kill sin in their lives. The Lord, that we would be militant about that. That we would wreak domestic terrorism upon the sin within us. God, for your sake, so that we can pursue Jesus without hindrance. And even more, God, because of our desire for Christ, that our love for Him, as the hymn says, the things of earth will grow strangely dim. So Lord, pray this now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you for joining Grace Community Church today. For more content, subscribe to our channel by hitting the subscribe button. If you want to be notified of new videos, make sure to click the notification bell. And we pray you make much of Jesus.